come up. So our final speaker in this session is uh, Charles O'Brien, uh, who is the Kenneth E. Appel uh, Professor of Psychiatry at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he established and directs the clinical research program on the treatment of addictive disorders, and his work uh, involves the exploration of CNS changes involved in relapse, new medications, behavioral treatments, and instruments for measuring the severity of disorders. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to especially thank the members of the Food Forum for putting together this, what I think could be a very useful topic because um, as you heard from Dr. Gearhart, the, the funding is an issue and I think that uh, setting up some uh, criteria for uh, studies that need to be funded and especially collaborative studies where you could uh, show uh, and utilize uh, similar criteria would uh, I think move the field potentially uh, a very long way. Uh, I want to apologize in advance as my voice peters out. Um, I've been sick for the past week with uh, fever and uh, upper respiratory illness and I'm hoping that I can last for the half an hour. Um, <clears throat> so my perspective on uh, this topic uh, comes from having spent 40 plus years treating uh, people who have unquestioned addiction and uh, trying to bring some order to that field because actually I got started treating addiction during the Vietnam War and um, hardly anybody knew anything about it because there was so little research done especially on the clinical aspects of it. And so we had to start uh, trying to bring some order to the field and start figuring out what works and what doesn't work. Um, the, the DSM-4, which you see on the slide, is the standard for mental illness that began in the 1990s. It got, it, uh, the or, or origins go back to the 1950s, actually. And every so many years, maybe as much as 10 or 15 years, a group of experts sits around and reviews all the recent literature and tries to see how far we've come in improving the diagnosis of mental illness. So the latest one is DSM-5, and I was the chair of the substance use disorders uh, section for that effort, and it became official last year. Um, so the um, Yale F Food Addiction Scale is based on DSM-4, but in fact, there aren't that many changes, there's some, some conceptual changes that I'll, I'll mention uh, in, the, um, uh, in, in the talk uh, between DSM-4 and DSM-5. But the big issue is whether you take a clinical problem from one field and try to squeeze it into another field and how much of the uh, concepts and the terminology do you change? And uh, this is a particularly problematic because for one thing, uh, there's always been a certain amount of debate about the words used for the different concepts uh, for uh, the various aspects of addiction, which are pretty much based on the classic opioid addiction, which is w where the, you know, the first research really began back in the 1930s and 40s. Um, and so other forms of addiction were, were based on that. Um, but now we have something which is arguably not really an addiction, but people have been misusing the term addiction for many years, and, and not just uh, in uh, clinical terms, but um, in normal usage. For example, there have been many articles about uh, the president saying that uh, the United States is addicted to oil and women are addicted to pink, and you, know, you could go on and on. You, you could say, I'm addicted to skiing because I really get euphoric when I see a field of powder snow, and I'm sure if I were in a brain scanner, you would see activation of my ventral striatum, nucleus accumbens, and, you know, and, but does that mean it's an addiction? Well, you, know, it, you can't really translate from skiing to drugs, uh, and so it's kind of hard to translate similarly from food to drugs, but if there's a good reason to do it, then maybe we should, and I think that's one of the questions that we have to try to answer. So what about DSM-5? You know, this is the um, 
current official terminology, and I, I have to say official because, you know, you, you have to have some regulations, and, um, uh, you know, if we, we know that there's basically a World Health Organization, which is the ICD, and the American Psychiatric Association, which is the DSM, which pretty much agree, but the most prominent one is the DSM, which is used all over the world, even in other countries. And we, um, we tried it to, to do a minimal amount of changes between DSM-4 and DSM-5. Um, oops, let's see, we'll go back. I just, I, I, actually I could go through each change, but I don't think it's that important. I just want to let you know that there were several other candidates that were proposed for, um, for, for uh, adding to, um, uh, to DSM-5, uh, um, and food addiction was one of them. And there were conferences between the food and eating disorders group and the drug addiction disorders group, and eventually the group decided that we should not add food addiction, although binge eating disorder was retained, and it's, it's an, an important and useful diagnosis. Sex addiction was also proposed and also was similarly rejected. And um, the most likely candidate is internet gaming disorder uh, because it is something that is accumulating very high clinical importance uh, in quite a few countries throughout the world. So we put it in section three and we think that as more data develop, and later on I'll explain to you how that might be a model for food addiction as to how um, something might get added to uh, the DSM-5 uh, as more uh, facts come out, more research is done. So um, if we look at what DSM-5 is, th th there's two things that are, are we start with is tolerance and withdrawal. And, and remember, these were built originally on opioid addiction. But tolerance and with, withdrawal, you'll see there's an asterisk after each of them because um, it's kind of a special case. It used to be that this was uh, a sign of, of addiction, but we now know that it's normal. So any of us in this room would develop tolerance and withdrawal to drugs that were given uh, repeatedly if uh, these are drugs that act on the nervous system. So it's a form of adaptation. And so that should not be used as criteria for addiction if, in fact, the person is being treated by a physician with prescription drugs. On the other hand, if they're being used outside of normal channels, then it can be a, an addiction. And we have to um, put it in that context. So that's a change from DSM-4. Um, and then the rest of these things have to do with uh, loss of control. Control is really a big thing, and I, and I realize that that's one of those things that we consider really essential for uh, drug addiction, loss of control. It's also important for food addiction, and that's why binge eating disorder comes the closest, uh, in our view, to, um, to a, a food addiction. Uh, craving is a, a very important symptom, and it's an added to the DSM-5 this time because we have a lot of brain imaging data showing that people who are in treatment for any kind of addiction tend to have craving for the substance, and that can last for years. And, and that's one of the issues about addiction. It's a long-term memory. It's a change in the brain, and if we were go going, I would go give you some data on the neurobiology of addiction in rats, where we've studied it the most, but basically it's something that goes on uh, for a long time after the last exposure to the drug. So craving has become very, very important. Um, so, of course, the, the loss of control is uh, un inability to cut down, uh, spending excessive time in acquiring the substance, giving up other activities for, uh, for the substance, using despite negative effects. Now, this is very clear <clears throat> with some drugs, and this is one of the things that is so striking for people who are addicted to cigarettes, because you see people who have emphysema, which essentially is air hunger, and uh, loss of oxygen is one of the most painful of all human subjective states. And people with emphysema who can barely breathe without smoking continue to smoke, even though it's hurting them. Or people who have 
cancer of the larynx will smoke cigarettes through the tracheostomy stoma, uh, which is, you know, another, so that's uh, uh, using despite negative effects, and there's lots of examples of that with other addicting drugs. So there's, there's no question about that. Um, failure to fulfill major role obligations and recurrent use in hazardous situations and continued use despite consistent social or interpersonal problems. So, you know, these are the classic signs of addiction and um, the Yale food addiction scale has tried to pattern itself after DSM-4 and I'm sure they can do a very good job of adapting it to DSM-5. Um, but still, it's, it's squeezing in something that was meant for drugs into something that is normal behavior for all of us. And, you know, certainly we can't have abstinence as a goal from food because obviously that's going to be, mean starvation. Um, and this is just to remind you um, that uh, not, not uh, counted if it's prescribed by a physician um, as the last one uh, there. Um, sorry, I keep forgetting how we're supposed to do this. Um, now, th this next slide shows four classes of drugs for which tolerance and withdrawal are normal. So that does not qualify for a sign of addiction because everybody who's exposed to these drugs will get this. And so that's one of the improvements in DSM-5 because in DSM-4, you could get wrongly diagnosed with a disorder when in fact you were just following your doctor's orders. One of the overall goals of the DSM process was to try to make psychiatric diagnosis more <clears throat> neuroscience based. Unfortunately, and we've been trying for years to find biomarkers for psychiatric disorders, the way we have them, say, for a metabolic disorder or cardiology disorder, you know, where we can, uh, you go to your cardiologist and you can get all sorts of tests that have some objective meaning. You, you can't really do this for your mental health. We, we want that, and, we, we, and so that's the reason why the National Institute on Mental Health has um, developed uh, these uh, research demand, uh, uh, d domain criteria, and, th and that's a good way to get uh, grant funding uh, now, actually, because uh, th th if, if you can come up with an experiment that demonstrates an objective biomarker in um, psychiatry and other people can replicate that, um, you're certain to get funded and that's going to be added to the DSM-5, it'll probably be 5.1. But anyway, this is, um, uh, th this is the goal. So we do have uh, the advantage in the addiction field of having very good animal models. We've developed some of our good treatments first in animal models and then brought them to the clinic. So this is true translational research. And uh, in terms of food addiction, animal models uh, show similarities and differences between CNS effects of sweet foods and drugs of abuse. And um, this is um, really uh, interesting. I, I keep having a problem with, uh, I'm trying to, trying to use the, um, for, the, for the people who are not in the room, can't see. But basically, if you look at this slide, it shows uh, self-administration of alcohol on the left, and on the right, sweetened condensed milk. So it's an intensely sweet substance, and these are rats as, as subjects. And uh, they are self-administering with a S plus, uh, so there's, a, there's a stimulus which is signifying the uh, presence of the uh, sweetened condensed milk, and they self-administer. And you can see in uh, this uh, slide that there, there's a very high level of self-administration. And then extinction is when they, it's no longer available. They, they bar press and they don't get the, uh, either the alcohol or the sweetened condensed milk, and they both go down. So far, it's very similar. Then you do a relapse, and relapse is a very important uh, part of studies of addiction because that's the uh, really a, a very important symptom uh, of, of addiction and a reinstatement and uh, this is the S negative and S plus 
and, and first, when they're exposed to the S+, plus, they, they think that they're going to get the substance again, but they don't because this is the reinstatement. And so they, they, they give the, uh, the, the self-administration. And those who had uh, been given previously uh, cocaine, they continue to self-administer, even though they're not getting any cocaine. But those who had been given sweetened condensed milk, that's extinguished right away. And so there's a, a, an important difference here between their reactivity to sweetened condensed milk and uh, to a, a drug like cocaine. This comes from uh, Bert Weiss's uh, lab in San Diego. And here's the same thing shown uh, with uh, cocaine compared to, uh, uh, the other was alcohol, sorry, this is cocaine. But the point is it's exactly the same. Uh, during the uh, reinstatement period, they reinstate quickly to cocaine, but not to sweeten condensed milk. So essentially, the self-administration value of the sweetened condensed milk does not last the way it does. But on the other hand, if you showed you know, where the sweetened condensed milk is activating the brain, it's the same uh, part of the brain. It's the uh, nucleus accumbens, the ventral striatum. Uh, but the, the, there's, there's a difference in this experiment between um, the uh, value uh, for an addiction between the intensely sweet substance versus the drug. Now, the, the, all of these things were discussed in the DSM-5 pr process, and uh, f uh, there were proponents for food addiction, but it was um, decided by the group not to uh, vote to ha have it uh, added, but I, I think that could change if more data are or brought forth. Uh, and now, uh, you've already seen a lot of the human brain imaging, and uh, I, um, I, I certainly agree uh, with the pr presenter on, um, on brain imaging that it's very, very useful. As a matter of fact, it's based on human brain imaging that we added gambling to the group of addictions. Oh, that's one of the main things, actually. And the same circuits and neurotransmitters are involved with, um, as, as demonstrated by brain imaging, imaging uh, that are involved uh, in uh, uh, all kinds of reward. And, I, and that, this is why I'm convinced that my brain would light up uh, if you showed me pictures of uh, good powder snow. But the fact that there, there's reports of pleasure correlates with activation of brain reward structures is expected and it's not enough to make a, all pleasure an addiction. So what are, what are some of the, the things that, that are lacking? Well, there, we have developed something and actually going back to the 1970s for doing treatment research in addiction and we call it the Addiction Severity Index. And uh, what we discovered was that when you're treating patients, you find that uh, they are disordered in a number of different spheres or dimensions. It's not just the drug. So when, when I got into this field, the only way you measured severity was the number of bags of heroin that somebody was dependent on. And so you would try to get them to go from a 10-bag-a-day habit to a 2-bag-a-day habit. Now that's, that's, first of all, not very useful. But it, it turns out that if they're using heroin, they typically have multiple other pr problems. So we started the Addiction Severity Index, which is now used all over the world, translated into about 20 plus different languages, um, because addicts all over the world uh, tend to resemble one another in this regard. And it uh, goes beyond just the, the drug. Um, this slide shows the seven different domains for the ASI. And the first one on the left is uh, the, the drug, um, and then medical problems, because they tend to go along with the, um, uh, the, the addiction, and then employment problems, legal problems, family problems, psychiatric problems. As a matter of fact, at least half of our patients tend to have another mental health disorder, such as depression or anxiety, or even schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Um, 
which may or may, uh, which may have been engendered by the drug or may be aggravated by the drug. But th these are not simple things. That, you know, I, I, I envy the people you know, using animal models because they can just go and buy another 50 rats and, uh, you know, and it's relatively clean. But the fact is that in the patients that we deal with, they have multiple problems. So this particular patient here is a young woman who uh, was admitted because she had spontaneous labor from using uh, cocaine and, um, uh, <clears throat> and she had uh, not quite the highest amount of cocaine use, but she had a lot of problems in these other spheres. And this is what led her to have a very bad outcome. So this was a p person who uh, had repeated relapses and was very difficult to treat. On the other hand, this was a young doctor who was on an even higher dose of drug, but he had no problems or very minimal problems with medical problems, no employment problems, and so forth. So his uh, prognosis was really good. So this, this kind of data illustrated the fact that uh, using simply uh, the quantity of drug use uh, was not uh, a useful measure of severity. So the way that we deal with severity now uh, it, with DSM-5 is severity is uh, based on the number of symptoms that uh, a, um, a person has uh, uh, and uh, there's a, t a, a maximum of 11 and the number of symptoms is, is the severity measure that we use. And that's important because, for example, one of the treatments we have for opiate addiction is uh, maintenance on an opiate like methadone or buprenorphine. And you can't qualify for that unless you have at least a moderate to severe level of severity on an, on an opiate. Um, so. Uh, you know, there are benefits from a clinical perspective of knowing uh, how to grade severity. And uh, I think that if we're going to translate addiction into the food sphere, then we're going to have to come up with ways of dealing with severity. And there, and there has to be some uh, validity measure. For example, I, I'm, I'm not exactly proposing this, but I'm giving you a for example of, you know, for severe food addiction, there would have to be uh, perhaps some, some degree of complication like diabetes or morbid obesity or, you know, something. But at some point, the, the correlation of the behaviors like you saw on the Yale food addiction scale has to be correlated, and, and, and they are correlated with weight and things like that. I think that, that to b really be meaningful from a clinical perspective, there has to be some... Uh, number of uh, severity, uh, validity studies, and there needs to be a common language. Um, so th these are some of the factors in adding a new diagnosis. This would be, you know, if we added food addiction to the standard lexicon, it would be a new diagnosis. And uh, if we wanted to do that, there would have to be, you know, some kind of a clinical need, for example, internet gaming disorder, that is common enough and it's severe enough that um, I think that's probably going to happen maybe within the next five to ten years. But, you know, we have a group of people that are having uh, Skype meetings, Internet meetings, and things like that who are trying to come up with definitions and taking the, the, the papers that exist in the literature and then trying to come up with some uh, consensus and then using the same criteria to, to run studies and see what works and what are the longitudinal uh, um, outcomes of uh, some of these uh, people who meet these criteria. Um, there's a potential for, for harm uh, to uh, putting a new diagnosis, so we, we don't do that uh, uh, lightly, and potential for treatment, obviously, that's the good reason. And, uh, of course, it has to meet criteria for a uh, a mental disorder. I mean, that just, just what is a mental disorder? That we spent a lot of time debating that um, because the um, the Congress actually has already criticized the field of psychiatry for over medicalizing things. And one of the things that was uh, cited is that uh, social anxiety disorder 
uh, you could characterize as shyness. And if you make shyness a diagnosis, you know, that's robbing the world of diversity. And, you know, because you, you, somebody who, who has social anxiety disorder, we can treat it with a medication and they become more sociable and more relaxed and so forth. And so is that good or bad? Have we done, have we done a disservice to the world? And, of course, the, the people always talk about the... Um, possibility that this is, has some financial motive that, you know, that they're, you're trying to uh, create new diagnoses. So, uh, you know, there, so they, there has to be criteria for a mental disorder. It has to be something that really uh, is um, a, a problem for people. So is the concept of food addiction useful? So that's one of the questions that I think we ought to try to answer here and we can we can discuss this in the discussion period coming up. Um, as somebody who's been identified with the process of naming and, you know, and, uh, and making a decision, I have been inundated with uh, letters and, uh, and, and brochures and invitations to come to food addiction weekends and things like that, you know, that, because there, there's, there's a group of well-intentioned people who already think that it's a diagnosis and think that we need to treat it and it needs to be covered by insurance. Um, and, you know, th this kind of enthusiasm, we, I, I hate to be a wet blanket, but I just think that we have to be cautious <coughs> because it, uh, you know, it's, it has to be founded on science rather than on enthusiasm. So the title addiction is an overused term. I've already mentioned that. I think that, that you know, that's, that, that's one of the things that um, uh, we, we have to be careful here. I, I wish that people uh, in this field could be satisfied with using another word. Dr. Gearhart and I were talking about that uh, during the break, you know. I mean, I'm, I think we're all, all already overusing addiction. However, there are people in my field who hate the word addiction, and therefore that's why we, we got the word dependence for a while, which caused a lot of trouble. Um, so some people want to reserve addiction for something that's really negative, and other people want to overuse it. I mean, you know, the, this is the difficulty that we have, uh, perhaps unique to this area <coughs> of medicine. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I mentioned internet gaming di addiction. I think that's a good example that we might follow here. <coughs> well, so I think I should sit down at this point before I totally lose my voice. And thank you very much for your attention. <coughs>